Hello and welcome to Strong Day, a patient-centered research initiative hosted by the Department of Family Medicine Residency Program here at Ascension Providence Hospital in Southfield, Michigan, where our motto is getting better, learning together. I'm your program host, Raswell Dean. I'm an attending physician here at Providence Hospital in our Department of Family Medicine, and I'm glad you're here with us, and I just want to say welcome. Very excited to go through this material with you. Our program goals here is to create an educational series hosted by our physicians here from our department in family medicine here. And we want to set up a research initiative designed to better engage, educate, and encourage our patients. Our intention is to better promote an understanding of metabolic insulin resistance syndrome and nutrition in general. We hope to provide an innovative patient support model for you. Who is it intended for? Well, diabetics and pre-diabetics, people who are overweight, pre-obese, obese, or morbidly obese, anybody suffering from something called metabolic syndrome, other folks with chronic conditions such as heart, kidney, or memory problems, you will benefit from this too. As you'll see, diabetes really affects all of these other diseases, and so does being overweight. Who it's intended for is physicians, caregivers, patients, and family members. We're all going to be going through material and learning together and walking through this with you. And really, my heart goes out for anybody who's struggling, trying to get your diabetes under control, trying to get your weight under control. My heart really goes out to you. We really care about each and every patient, and we want you to feel like we want to take an extra step to walk through things with you. So again, just as a quick reminder, uh, our program is called Strong Day, um, and it's intended to help you have a little bit stronger day. Um, and we're also intended to be general healthcare education. So please don't replace this um, as advice from your personal physician. This is our very first um, topic. So I'm really excited to kick this off. And as we continue, we'll have more um, physicians and other doctors and other guests with us as we build the program out. So this is really ground zero. And I'm just wanting to welcome each and every one of you to this ground zero. So I've, we, we titled it, vital concepts. Get in the game. And so many times I, I see diabetic patients or obese patients or they've got something going on and they're just, I, the only way to describe it is I, we got to get you in the game. And if you're getting this video, you may be looking at this because maybe your doctor has said um, you need to get in the game. We need to get that A1C better or we need to try to help you figure out how to lose some weight. And maybe you've been trying, or maybe you've been frustrated, or, you know, you're just feeling down in the dumps about it. Well, hopefully, this is going to get you in the game. So let's start, okay? So the first question is, you know, I just want to ask you, maybe ask you to ask yourself, how's it going? How's it really going? Do you feel like um, you've got a handle on stuff? Or do you feel like sometimes there's just not enough time to talk with your doctor when you come to the doctor's office? Yeah, you're not alone. Everybody feels this way. And the doctors are frustrated too because they, they feel like they don't have enough time sometimes to spend with the patients because the, there's so many people coming in and the appointments are only so long. So patients can get frustrated and so can the doctors. And what we want to do as doctors here we want to give you more information so that you can think about it and work on stuff so that when you come to the doctor's office, you'll feel like you're a little bit better prepared. And on the other hand, you know, how's it going? Have you seen the diabetic teachers lately? Well, sometimes, you know, it's really hard to get out, especially this past year 
with all the, the different viruses and quarantines and things. But sometimes it's just hard to get out, to get a ride or to, you know, to schedule your time, you know, to sit down with somebody. So w the information is so important. We want to put it in a way where we'll give you a little bit and we're hoping we can give you a little bit every day, but we're making this content for you because we really do care about you. So I hope it's going okay, but this program is really designed for folks that it's not going okay and, and really anybody who wants to get going a little bit better. And so, you know, you look at all the different kinds of, of dietary advice for food, you know, and you can look at the internet and the newspapers and magazines, and it just seems like every time you turn around, there's a new diet. Every time you turn around, somebody's got, you know, some good, you know, diet plan or weight loss pro, you know, thing for you, and you just don't know what to do. And when you look at the research, you know, studies have found about 98%, um, you know, 98% of people who lose weight on a diet are going to gain it back in five years. Isn't that wild? Most diets fail if you, if you look at the research. And also, about 90% of people who lose weight will actually end up gaining back more weight than they originally lost. Doesn't that blow your mind? It, it's, these are depressing statistics. And here's one, only 5 to 10%, sorry about that little pop-up, every once in a while it'll pop up, but only about 5 to 10% of people who are on a, quote, diet maintain weight loss that's greater than 10% of the initial weight when they started. So, for example, if you weigh 200 pounds and you want to lose weight, your chance of keeping off just 20 pounds is only 5 to 10%. I mean, that's not very encouraging. And it seems like we're located in Southfield. It seems like everybody in Southfield wants to lose weight. But it's, I don't see many people in Southfield losing weight. And that just got me thinking. So we really want to, we really care before we get started. We just want to say we really care about you getting better. And we want to walk this walk beside you. And that's why we call this program Strong Day because we want every day to be a strong day for you, a day that's stronger than the net last one. But our motto is, is getting better, learning together. Nobody's Superman or Superwoman. And... Um, Everybody's got their own uh, road to walk, but we want to try to walk with you to get better and help you learn together as we all try to learn together and get better. So before we get, begin on this, I wanted to take a few minutes and look at a few facts about diabetes in particular and obesity in particular. Those are two big things that affect your health. It affects so many parts of your health, and, and so much time and effort goes into blood sugar and obesity. But I wanted to talk about how these things relate to our food. Okay, here's a couple of quick facts. Sometimes you go to the doctor and they check an A1C, okay? That's a little number. Whether you're, sometimes you're obese and they check an A1C because they're trying to screen you for diabetes, or maybe... You already have diabetes, and you're checking this thing called the A1C. But why does the doctor care so much? Because for every 1% reduction in the A1C, it reduces the diabetes-related death rate 21%. It reduces heart attack rate 14%. It, it reduces what we call microvascular complications by 37%. You know, you've heard of people having problems with circulation in the legs and the feet, and you've heard about people getting, you know, an amputated toe or foot or something like that. Those are microvascular complications. As a matter of fact, it's, they're almost, they almost go all hand in hand. You know, the amputation, people get amputations, and it's just very rare, almost, almost very rare that someone doesn't have diabetes when this is occurring. So look at, look at all these things. 
that are affected by your A1C. That's why the doctor cares so much. And if you're somebody who's worried about, you know, slipping in the mind a little bit, oh, I'm always wondering, I'm forgetting stuff. Does that mean I have diabetes? Or, I mean, I'm sorry, does that mean I have uh, Alzheimer's? You know, a lot of people come in with that. And if you do, you're not alone. But did you know that people who have poor control of their diabetes have a higher rate of decline in their memory? And a lot of people are calling Alzheimer's type dementia diabetes type 3. We'll probably get into that more in a different uh, episode of this. But just to let you know that cognitive decline, memory problems, is very highly associated with poorly controlled blood sugars. And this is kind of a, a busy slide, but it, it sums up a lot of statistics, and that's why I wanted to use it. You know, look up here. 70%, you know, of our U.S. diet is made up of processed foods, artificial foods, sort of man-made foods, like the fast food industry. You know, 70% of our diet, you know, is fast food. That's, you know, it has its pros and cons. You know, fast food has a place. You know, it's cheap food, inexpensive food. We get that, but it also is contributing, as we're going to see later, to perhaps some of our weight problems. Americans spend about 10% of their disposable income on fast foods. That's when you have money in your pocket and you just say, hey, you know what, let me go grab a burger or a donut or a latte or something like that. And look at this. Americans eat about 130 pounds of sugar a year. That's a lot of sugar. And about one out of every three adults are obese. And your doctor measures you all the time when you come in. If your BMI is over 30, that's what you get. You get obese, you know, as a diagnosis. And in the early 2000s, 60% of all the middle schools and high schools were selling, you know, the sugar drinks in the vending machines. And you wonder why obesity is becoming more and more of a problem, even in high school kids. Nowadays, a lot of elementary schools are overweight. So we'll look at this. And then you have to look, we're sort of bombarded also with these processed foods. Processed foods are really designed for shelf life. And a lot of the ingredients in these processed foods, as we're going to see as we go down this journey, will contribute to weight gain. And we'll go into that. But let's just keep that on our radar for now. But I wanted to, I want to start our lesson with what, what the heck is sugar? Why are we so concerned about it? Okay, so this may be a good starting point. And this is what I've counseled a lot of my patients on as time has gone on. So sugar, it's like, let's pretend it's a little molecule right here. And we call this little molecule a monosaccharide. You might have heard that name before. Mono means one. Saccharide is the sugar molecule. But if we, if we put a bunch of these little sugar molecules together, we get what's called a polysaccharide. So polysaccharides, poly means many, it's like we're building a little choo-choo train. Okay? So we call these polysaccharides carbohydrates. All right, you've probably heard that word before too. And sometimes we refer to carbohydrates as starches. Okay? And all that means are just references to longer chains of these little saccharide molecules into what we call long chain polysaccharides. Okay? So the first thing to know is that sugar are carbohydrates and carbohydrates are sugars. If you eat a whole bunch of carbohydrates and you digest the carbohydrates, they turn right back in to simple sugars, simple monosaccharides. And if you're making food, you put a whole bunch of sugars together, 
you got yourself a carbohydrate. All right? But it's interesting to me that we kind of understand that, but we really relate to our food very, very differently. So on one hand, we kind of know what is bad for us. We know candy, ice cream, you know, eating a chocolate bar or like a milkshake. You know that's bad. And you know if you have diabetes or you're trying to watch your weight, you probably, you know you shouldn't eat those kind of things because you know that's sugar. But isn't it interesting that when you make a carbohydrate, a complex carbohydrate over here, it looks very different. And that kind of food we relate to a lot differently. And carbohydrates are really common in our diet. And we think we're eating healthier bread, rice, pasta, potatoes. You know, that's what you would think is going to be on a good plate of food. And obviously that sounds healthier than eating a whole bunch of ice cream every night or anything made of flour or wheat or grits or oatmeal or orange juice or apple juice or Gatorade when you're thirsty and you've had a workout at the gym. Isn't it interesting that to your body, all that stuff is just sugar? You go to the gym and try to work out to lose weight, and you chug a whole bunch of Gatorade down, <laughs> and you don't realize that Gatorade's full of sugar. Or you want to eat a good breakfast, a hearty breakfast. I love grits. I'm from the South. I love them. Well, they're full of sugar. So we have to think about that. So when you eat a carbohydrate or a simple sugar, your body doesn't know the difference. Once this gets digested, it doesn't care. It doesn't know. So your body makes insulin. Insulin is a hormone secreted by your pancreas. And what happens is, is insulin helps your body digest this sugar. Okay? That's what insulin does. And if you eat sugar over time, over you know, many, many years, your body's going to have to produce a certain amount of insulin to handle a certain amount of sugar. It's really fascinating to know that, that your body has to control sugar very, very tightly with this insulin. You, you don't have more than a teaspoon of, of sugar circulating in your bloodstream at any point. How about that? So your body makes insulin, but over time, you know, you know, when you go in to see the doctor, they draw your blood and they say, hey, you know, your blood sugar looks good. Your sugar looks good. That means your body's making insulin to handle, you know, the sugar, the carbohydrates that you eat. But over the years, people will get a little bit resistant to all the insulin that their body has to make. And if they continue to eat sugar, over the years, what we are finding is that the body begins to get a little resistant to the insulin. Okay? And you think about that for a minute. You know, any other hormone that your body makes, the body can get resistant to. You know, like estrogen's a hormone or testosterone's a hormone. And so your body has to make a little bit more to get the job done or thyroid hormone, or all of the other hormones that your body makes. Insulin is no different. And so over time, your body's going to get a little bit more insulin resistant. That means your body has to make more insulin to handle the same amount of sugar that you just ate. And that's because your body is insulin resistant. It's getting a little bit more resistant to the insulin. And then one day you're going to come into the daughter and the daughter's going to draw your blood and, he's going to, and the daughter is going to say, hey, wait a minute. Hey, look, there's a little bit of sugar left over in your bloodstream. You're getting a little pre-diabetic. And you go, huh, well, where did that come from? And over time, if you don't change what you're doing, you still put sugar or carbs in your body. Your body still has to make more insulin, okay? And pretty soon it's got to make a lot more insulin until when the doctor draws your blood, 
the doctor says, hey, you know what? Your blood sugar is even higher than it was last time. You're diabetic. And the, the paradox is that now the blood sugar is high, and if we measured the insulin in these patients, the insulin would be high as well because the body has, met, has become more resistant to the insulin that the body's pancreas has been making. Now, this is called type 2 diabetes. This is not type 1. Type 1 is uh, only about 10% of the, of the U.S., and they wouldn't, their problem is they can't make insulin. So what we're going to be looking at today is the type 2 diabetics. That's more than likely what most all of you have, if we're just playing the odds, about 90% of the U.S. population has type 2, and it's exploding all over the place. So when, I, when I'm referring to diabetes from here on out, I'm really meaning type 2 diabetes, okay? This is a problem of too much insulin. We have the insulin resistance. So when you look at the figures, and I put a few little handmade graphs up here, but the numbers are accurate, but I just wanted to give you some visual here. If we look at a pie chart of the whole U.S. population, this is CDC data, about 25 percent, a quarter of the country has di type 2 diabetes, okay? So there's that little sliver on that pie chart. And down here, look at this. This represents the, another about 25 percent of the population we call pre-diabetes, okay? A1C is 5.7 to about 6.5. So that's what this represents. And this little sliver over here represents just about another 20% of the people have normal blood sugars but have insulin resistance and don't know it yet and they're destined to be diabetic. This group right here. These are people going into their daughters. Maybe they're gaining weight. Maybe something's wrong. But the blood sugars happen to be normal. But they're, they're, one day, they're going to reveal themselves as pre-diabetic. And when you add all these numbers up, about 75% of the country has insulin resistance in some form or fashion, either insulin resistance that we don't know about, insulin resistance with prediabetes, or insulin resistance with frank diabetes. And we call this syndrome metabolic insulin resistance syndrome. That is really what diabetes is. It is an insulin resistance syndrome. And honestly, this represents a complete epidemic. When 75% of the country has a problem like this, something's wrong. Something is wrong. And we've got ourselves a metabolic epidemic on our hands. Now, there's another part to the puzzle. Pause for drama. <laughs> So here's our, here is our uh, little graph, but I wanted to show you that insulin is also in charge of something else. Insulin is in charge of fat metabolism. Okay? Now, if you're an obese person, now you're kind of going, hmm, whoa, this is getting a little bit more interesting. Insulin controls sugar, as we see on the left, but on the right, we also see that insulin controls fat. And when insulin levels are elevated in our bodies, hormonally, that means insulin suppresses your body's ability to burn fat. Let me say that again. When your insulin levels are high, you cannot burn fat. No way. This explains so many people who come and say, you know what, doc? 
I go to the gym four or five days a week. I work out. I do everything. I can't lose a pound. It's driving me crazy. I want to be put on some medicine, or I want to think about maybe, you know, some operation or something. The interesting thing is, is that when insulin levels are high, you can't burn fat. But in addition to that, high insulin levels also stimulate your body to make more fat. And as time goes on, when we do studies of people in their 30s to 40s, and then compare the 40s to the 50s, and then compare the age 50s to the 60s, about every 10 years we see people get heavier. People are just getting heavier through life. Most people don't weigh the same weight they weighed in college. And a little bit in college, they don't really weigh the same weight that they did in high school. Over the years, people get heavier. Most people. But this is a real important concept in people who are dealing with their weight. So, what do we have right now? We have a diabetes epidemic on one hand. The incidence of diabetes is skyrocketing. But at the same time, we have an obesity epidemic. And we cannot look at one without looking at the other. And these are manifestations of what we are going to be looking into in this Strong Day program what we are going to be calling metabolic insulin resistance syndrome. So our strategy is going to be to try to talk with you about nutrition. So if we were to lower sugar and lower carbohydrate intake in our diet, see up here at the top, that means we lower the amount of sugar down here that our insulin has to process. Our insulin has to help our body digest, or I mean use. It's been digested, but insulin um, doesn't have as big a job to do. And when that happens, our production of insulin goes down. And when that happens, insulin resistance begins to go down. And if you wanted to hear something hopeful out of all this talk, I hope you are listening right now. The fact that you can drop your insulin resistance means so much. Because if that's the case, you drop your insulin resistance and your body will now be able to burn fat. As a matter of fact, that fat that your body burns, those dietary fats are natural ketones that your body can burn in a healthy way to take the place of sugar. And yes, your brain can use it too. So we're going to be talking about how that is such a powerful way for you to try to lose weight and, if need be, at the same time, control your blood sugar. And it's often been said that people are going to be able, people are going to, be able to um, lose weight more in the kitchen than they will in the gym. I mean, you can go to the gym all you want and work out, but where the weight loss really begins is in the kitchen, in your dietary choices. Please, I hope, I hope, if you've been feeling overwhelmed, please look at this. You can take a picture of this with your phone if you want and show your friends. But just know that, yes, you can drop your insulin resistance and get a handle on diabetes and get a handle on your weight. So we're going to talk, as this course goes on, about using a low-carbohydrate, healthy, fat diet. Let's look at it a different way. Insulin resistance here. If we eat too many carbohydrates, our blood sugar rises. If our blood sugar rises, our insulin, oops, sorry about that. If our blood sugar rises, we have to release more insulin. If we release more insulin, the insulin then drops the blood sugar 
as it helps the body use it. And as blood sugar drops, we get hungry again and again and again. We store fat, and then we eat more carbs. We eat more and more. And it's kind of a cycle if you look at it in this regard. Now, this is usually where somebody comes up to me and says, well, you know what, that sounds pretty good, but my best friend, he went to his doctor or personal trainer or something, or that he saw something on the Internet that says we should count calories. You know, who's right? Do I count, you know, calories or do I count carbohydrates? It's a fair question. Let, let me show you something. Here's a big plate of Oreo cookies, okay? Now, if you're just counting Oreo cookies and you don't really care, well, here's the nutrition facts and one serving of Oreo cookies is just um, four, okay? I'm sorry, one serving is three cookies. And so, if you have one serving of three cookies, that could be 180 calories. You say, well, okay, that's not too much, just eating three cookies, if you have that much self-control. Now, for me, I'd be eating this whole plate, okay? A whole plate of that is four servings, and that's like almost 1,000 calories. But let's just say you ate, you know, one serving, okay? Well, one serving here is 25 carbs, okay? That's sugar. So the, if somebody brought you that plate of cookies and said, okay, you eat this for dinner tonight, you know, what do you think? Which is more healthy? Counting just calories? Like your body is so, your body is so um, simple, it doesn't know the difference? Or actually counting the carbs? Which is going to hurt you worse? Obviously, a plate full of Oreo cookies is not going to be very healthy. Why? Because the plate full of Oreo cookies is going to stimulate insulin. And insulin is going to spike because Oreo cookies have a lot of sugar. That's going to make your blood sugar go up, and that's going to make you gain weight. So, yes... Calories matter, but the quality of the calorie is critical. The quality. But remember, a calorie is just a unit of energy, okay? Your body doesn't know. It's just energy to your body. But when you put in a different kind of a calorie, that matters because the quality of the calorie triggers a hormone, and the hormone is insulin and glucagon. We'll talk about glucagon in another chapter, but insulin hormone is what we're talking about. So it's a hormonal thing, not just a thermodynamic thing. The body is, you know, this calorie, this, this talking about counting calories is something a professor comes up with in a, in a, in a lab, but, but we know that the body is more complex than that. So it's the quality of the calorie as it as it relates to the magnificent hormonal uh, milieu that the body has. The quality matters, not the absolute number. So our macronutrients are, you know, that's a word, big word called macronutrient. That means what are the types of food? We have proteins, we have fats, and we have carbohydrates. And just know that there are essential proteins that your body needs and there are essential fats that your body needs. You know, maybe not everybody knew that. But there are no essential carbs that your body needs. You, there is no essential sugar that you have to have. And even if you don't eat a speck of sugar, your body will make sugar because your red blood cells have to have sugar. But you can do just fine and never have sugar. Interesting, isn't it? So now let me ask you a question. Which contains more sugar? 
an apple, or a donut? Well, you have to think to yourself, well, you know, gee whiz, that's kind of a, you know, maybe it's a, you know, a trick question because an apple a day keeps the daughter away, right? And donuts are, you know, now that we just said all these things about food, you know, there's no way I'm going to have a donut now. I'm diabetic or I'm trying to lose weight. Obviously, I'm going to eat the apple, right? Let's look and see. It's about the same. An apple has about 25 grams of carb, and so does a donut. And you say, what? Yeah. Apples contain fructose. It's a very, very sweet form of sugar. It's about the same as the donut, the sugar in the donut. Which one's sweeter to your body? They're both the same to your body. And you say, well, I've always been told apples are good. Well, these are apples. The apples today that, are being, that you see in your grocery store are not the apples from the Bible. They're just not. They've been bred to be very sweet. So, apples have just about the same carbohydrate value as the donut. And you say now, well, now you're blowing my mind. I don't even know what to, what to do anymore. You know, somebody help me. And that's what we're going to do in this Strong Day program. We're going to get down in the kitchen with you. We're going to talk about food, what to buy at the grocery store, what to hold off. You know, men, sometimes they just need to know what to do. They don't know about food that much, just as long as it's, it's there, they'll eat anything. And sometimes the ladies do all the buying. Sometimes it's the other way around. People just need to know, please, somebody tell me what to do. You can take a picture of this if you want with your phone and you'll have it. But when I'm talking to patients, um, the first thing I'll do is I'll say, well, look, what's on the no-no list? And we can make this really complicated or, you know, I'm trying today to get you in the game. That's the title of this talk, get you in the game. So what we want to do right now is I want to challenge you, and you can take a picture of this part too with your phone if you want to, But how much bread, rice, pasta, and potatoes are you eating? Look around your kitchen. What is in your kitchen? We just got through saying that bread, rice, pasta, and potatoes are carbohydrates. They are complex carbohydrates. They are going to make your blood sugar go up. And if you're having trouble with your weight, and you really want to try to lose weight, you you got to cut this out. If you're trying to get control of your diabetes, for all those reasons, to try to make that A1C go down, your doctor's trying like crazy to help you, and you're eating bread, rice, pasta, and potatoes at home, you got to cut that out. What about breakfast time? Are you eating oatmeal? There's a lot of people eating oatmeal. That's made of a grain, and that grain is a complex carbohydrate. It'll make your blood sugar go up. Look at me. I'm from Georgia. I eat grits. I'd eat them three times a day if you gave them to me. Grits are a grain. They're going to make your blood sugar go up. And if you're trying to lose weight or control your diabetes, get rid of the oatmeal, get rid of the grits, the bread, the rice, the pasta, potato, and yes, toast and jelly. Toast is made of bread, the last time I checked. And it doesn't matter whether it's whole wheat toast or rye or white toast. It doesn't matter. Toast is bread. And then you, you, eat, a, you eat toast, and then you slap some jelly on it, and you've got a sugar bomb. And then you swig that down with a little apple juice or orange juice at breakfast time because, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And, and um, maybe orange juice will, with that good old vitamin C in there. They don't tell you there's all that ton of sugar in there. Put a little vitamin C in there and they tell, tell you it's healthy. Or all the other fruit juices they sell. There's so many of them, I can't even list them all. I love grape juice. Ugh. It makes my teeth turn purple, but 
but I love fruit juice. But no, all that stuff is sugar water. One of my patients was drinking lemonade every night to try to, you know, he thought that would be a good thing to prevent kidney stones, you know, and he's struggling to try to control his diabetes. His blood sugars in the mornings were always sky high. Yep, lemonade counts. You wouldn't believe how many people are drinking Gatorade at the gym. And they're giving Gatorade to these young kids, too, out on the field, you know, in different matches. But some of these kids are, are doing the sports because they're trying to lose weight. you got to be careful with the Gatorade. It's full of sweetener. That's why they can market it to children. Now, I'm going for the juggler vein here, folks. Pancakes, waffles, maple syrup, man. That hits the target pretty close to home. Whew. That's my weak spot, one of them, but you can't do it. Pancakes, no go. Waffles, no go. Maple syrup, forget it. French fries, yeah, the last time I checked, French fries were made out of, uh, what was it, potatoes? So no hash browns or French fries. If you're going to go grab a hamburger or a hot dog, don't use the bun because that's bread. You can have a great hamburger, you know, with... Uh, with the lettuce and tomatoes or onions or pickles, you know, put all that stuff on there. Have yourself too. Put some cheese on it. But cool it on the buns. And again, the apples, oranges, bananas. You know, you see that everybody's taking those to work for a snack, right? But they're going to make you fat. They're going to make your blood sugar go up. Okay? This is as simple as I can get you in the game here. Here's your grocery list over here. Let's look over here. You're not going to starve. I'm not trying to get you to starve. I'm trying to let you identify foods with sugar in it and foods without sugar in it. Now, you like meat? Bacon, beef, chicken, ham, jerky, pastrami, pepperoni, pork, salami, sausage, turkey, shrimp, crab, salmon, sardines, scallops, and tuna. If you like meat, there's no reason you can't have meat. Meat is a healthy protein, and you can eat a lot of it. Why? Because it won't make your sugar go up. And research has said that as people age, people who have good protein content in their bodies do much better health-wise. So, meats are going to be good for you. And dairy products, if you like butter, eggs, heavy cream, sour cream, or Greek yogurt, those are good. They don't have sugar in it. They're not going to make you fat, and they're not going to rise your sugar. Now, you say to yourself, well, Greek yogurt, got to be careful because some Greek yogurts are, some yogurts are sweet. They put sweetener in there. And some of these, like Yoplait, they have a lot of carb in there, almost like drinking a Coca-Cola, some type of pop has a lot of sweetener in there. Almond milk, if you're a milk drinker, almond milk, get the unsweetened variety. Or hemp, rice, or soy, but like almond milk, a lot of people use that because milk can make your blood sugar go up. If you like cheese, knock yourself out. There are lots of cheeses you can do. And you can use cheese with your meats. Cheese is a snack. Let's look over here just for a few minutes. Um, this, these are the fruits and veggies. Um, since we sort of vilified apples, oranges, and bananas, let me just sort of um, bring you back some hope here. Berries, like the pigmented berries, like uh, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, they are rich in vitamin C. They are rich in um, digestible fiber, among other things, soluble fiber. Um, but 
they are um, a lot less sweet than apples, oranges, and bananas. So the carbohydrate content is lower. But don't, you know, go crazy on the berries. But just to let you know that those are better. Avocados, probably one of the best ones. Um, obviously, salads are good, you know, and you can pair salads with, you know, any of your meats over here with a vinaigrette on your salad. I just wanted to say a, a word about the salads that you might make. You know, be, beware of the salad dressings because a lot of these salad dressings um, are loaded with sugar. So, um, like, vinaigrettes ought to be good. I would keep the salad dressings to about three carbs per tablespoon um, in terms of the sugar content. Um, so you can use salads. Um, cauliflower, just a, a word of the wise, they make cauliflower rice at the grocery store. So you can get a cauliflower rice, and that'll take the place, you know, maybe of some of this rice over here that you're wishing you had. You can use that, pair that with your meat, or um, you can saute onions or saute vegetables and put in your cauliflower rice and have that as a stir-fry. It's quite, quite good. Eggplant is a wonderful pairing. Um, you probably have your own favorites here. Uh, I wanted to throw in a little word about zucchini. Zucchini uh, at the grocery store, they make a zucchini pasta. They cut up the zucchini into pasta. You can cook it like pasta and then put a marinara sauce on that and pair that with the meat, and it's really good. Of course, the zucchini, it tastes like you're almost having a, it has a salad flavor to it, but it does fulfill a lot of that sometimes if people crave pasta. Squash, um, like butternut squash, is much less um, uh, it has less carbohydrate value than, than a regular potato does. So if you have to have something that is like um, a potato, you can make uh, butternut squash into um, something that looks like sweet potatoes and tastes a lot like sweet potatoes. So, you know, look at this. Um, this is not the end-all, be-all. This is just a simple list of fruits and vegetables that gets you in the game. Nuts and seeds, um, you can have almonds, pecans, macadamians are very, very good um, for snacks. And uh, as we go through this Strong Day program, we're going to talk little, uh, a lot more about these foods and snacks and things like that. But I wanted just to say a few quick things to get you in the game. If you bake, uh, make sure you avoid white flour. White flour is a super-duper strong carbohydrate. So you would want to bake your cake or cookies or brownies or whatever using almond flour, coconut flour, or flax flour flaxseed flour. You have, to, you have to experiment a little bit because the baking is a little bit different with that kind of flour, but um, just remember, you got to be careful. You don't want to eat things baked with white flour, or that includes um, like chicken fingers, like, you know, breaded chicken. Um, I did not put on this, this on the foods to avoid. I probably should have, but, but, you know, chicken fingers is is a big no-no. It'll make your blood sugar go up. Or anything with the breaded flour. Be careful. Okay, so we want to create a budget for the day, a carb budget. And you, you're probably saying, well, thanks for all those foods, but I just don't know, you know, how much of anything to eat. And so they do make um, apps for your smartphone. One of them is called Carb Manager. One of them is called Lose It. One of them is called My Fitness Pal. And another one that I'm going to show you is called One Touch Reveal. That's, a, that's an app that you can record your blood sugars with. But let's look at Carb Manager for a second. This is, these, are, these are a few screenshots of Carb Manager. So, yes, you can scan your food with Carb Manager, and it'll tell you exactly how many carbohydrates you're eating. Yes, you can create a little budget if you want. And, you know, I would challenge you. Every single thing you put in your mouth you can look it up on Carb Manager, and it'll tell you, like for breakfast, how many carbs you just ate. Like two, in this, 
in this one, two eggs is one carb. Sausage, uh, medium link, no carbs. No carbs in the meat. You can eat a really good breakfast and not have hardly any carbs for breakfast. Okay? So use an app like Carb Manager. I would challenge you. I would challenge you. At least for 30 days. Maybe 60. Or maybe more than that. To get in the game, you have got to record everything you eat so that you learn what foods have high carbs and what foods don't. And I want you to talk with your doctor at some point. I usually recommend my patients start with maybe a 50-gram carb budget for the day and maybe work your way down to 40 or 30 because a lot of Americans are used to eating 150, 200, 250 carbs a day. So to get you into a position to reverse your insulin resistance, we need to drop that carbohydrate down for you to lose weight and for you to start dropping that A1C. Because if you can drop that A1C, you might get a normal A1C when you were pre-diabetic. And you're able to turn that pre-diabetes around into a normal reading and maybe avoid medicine. Or maybe you're somebody who's sick and tired of medicine, and if you can drop that daily carb load down, and all of a sudden your sugars are coming down, maybe you can start taking less medicine. But again, this is a great place to talk with your doctor about this, because everybody's different, but you really do need to know the carbohydrate value of the foods you're putting in your body and try to begin to see what it feels like to have a budget to be accountable for yourself to what you're eating. You need a game plan. You need to get in the game. Now, here's, a, here's another app I want to show you about. Now, oh, before I forget, Carb Manager, this is just one of them, it's free. All these apps are free, but I like Carb Manager because it doesn't make you pay for counting your carbs. Some of the others do. Here's One Touch Reveal. This is a free app. It helps you record your blood sugars. And I've looked at just about all of them. And I like this one probably the best of all. Why? Look at how beautiful these numbers are displayed here. They, it, it is such a beautiful way to display it. I highly, highly recommend. If you go to your doctor and you just give him your, your glucose meter, he's not going to, or he or she, are, they're not going to be able to make heads or tails over these numbers. But if you put them in an order like this, there's breakfast, lunch, dinner, bedtime, or overnight. And the little apple means that's before breakfast. And the, you know, you've eaten the apple, that's after, you've, after the meal. So it's before and after lunch, before and after dinner. And that's real important to know whether your, your, your sugar before or it's after the meal. This is a really, really well laid out app. Highly recommend you using it. You'll get a lot of insight into your meals. And then there's a day view. And in the day view, you can track your steps. If you're trying to get 10,000 steps, you can track, it's like a pedometer in there. If you're exercising every day, you can track how many minutes you did for your exercise. And every time you meet your goals, this thing lights up a different color. You can track in your little carb, carbohydrates, and you can track how many day, time is a day you're tracking your blood sugar. I like this so much. This is sort of the day view, the running tally on how the day has been going for you. And the most recent value is at the top. And another thing I'll just show you is that from the readings that you're giving the app, it starts projecting what your A1C might look like when you go to see the doctor's office. Like an average blood sugar of 130 is going to be 6.2. So, yeah, it sort of lets you know where you are because that A1C number really matters, doesn't it, as we said earlier. 
And I want you to get in the habit, again, talking with your doctor, but, you know, if you're testing your blood sugar and you're working on your carbohydrate intake, what you need to do is you need to look at breakfast as sort of a block of time. And so whatever you're eating at breakfast, you want to make sure that after breakfast, the after breakfast, two hours after your meal is not over 140. Or one hour after the meal, it doesn't go up by 35. Let's take a look. What are the goals? It's a pretty good segue here. Talk with your daughter, but in general, when you're checking it in the morning, like this is breakfast, bef like this is breakfast time before the meal, this is like the morning reading here, you need to be less than 100 in the morning. Okay, because over 100, you're sort of in that pre-diabetic range. Now, some, of, some uh, sources say that if you check your sugar one hour after the meal, you want it to go up only, you want it to go up less than 35. So in other words, for an example, if before the meal you're 100 and one hour after the meal you're 134, that's, that's good. You don't want a big sugar spike. So that's another way of looking at it. And then another way of looking at it is two hours after the meal, you want it to be less than 140. Okay? So your one-hour sugar spike shouldn't spike up more than 35, whatever number you're at before the meal. Two hours after the meal, less than 140, less than 100 in the morning. Those are some general goals, and I think this little uh, app will help you visualize your goals. So try to look at breakfast and get control of breakfast, and then look at lunch, and then look at dinner time. And you got to remember, if you're not keeping your carbohydrate budget constant, you're never going to get control of your sugars. And we'll talk more about this in another uh, part, but if you give yourself a budget around um, 12, uh, 6 carbs at breakfast, 12 at lunch, and 12 at dinner, I know I didn't write it down, but give yourself maybe 6, 12, and 12. Give yourself a little budget. That's one way to get control of your carbs for that particular meal because you want to be able to test enough to where you feel better about what you're eating at breakfast is not going to cause you to get in trouble. And then you focus on what you're eating at lunch so it won't get you in trouble and what you're eating at dinner. Okay? So that'll get you in the game for the testing part. Now, I just threw this in at the last minute because one of the things I've seen over and over is patients, um, you know, they're running out of test strips and the insurance won't cover more than testing one time a day, you know, if you don't take insulin or maybe two times a day if you do take insulin. And, you know, you, that's, to me that is so crazy. You know, look at this testing. And to think to yourself, I've got to try to make decisions about my breakfast, my lunch, and my dinner just testing one time a day. Or you try to test and you run out of strips and you're not testing at all. You know, until, you know, a month or so until you can get some more test strips. Or you have to try to get some prior authorization or something. It's crazy. It's crazy. And so I'm just, I'm going back to this thing because to be able to be, be confident, I mean, this is your health we're talking about. So the things that really add up to the cost are these test strips. The glucometer themselves are pretty cheap. And I've seen test strips go for $150 a box, $200 a box, $50 a box. But on Amazon, my wife found this, CareTouch blood strips. Here's 100 test strips. This is what they look like. 
nineteen dollars for a box of a hundred. You want some lancets? Three hundred lancets for eight bucks. Thirty gauge. Keep things affordable. Now, maybe your doctor has prescribed and you've got lancets and strips, but it might be worth it. You don't need a prescription for this. It might be worth it for you. You can order this right off Amazon, and I'm not, I don't have any relationship with this company, and I'm not plugging it, but I'm just saying you can look around and find things like this. They'll ship it right to your house, and you can test pretty intensively for a month or two and get confident in trying to work on getting your blood sugars under control. Keep it affordable, but my goodness gracious, the health benefits to you of getting your diabetes under control or trying to work on your blood sugars so you can get your weight under control, don't let anybody, any insurance company, any prior authorization try to stand in your way to get control of your diabetes. You don't need a prescription for this stuff. So, as we conclude, what are our takeaways? Use some kind of an app to help you record everything you eat, at least for 30 days. Give yourself a 30 or 40 gram per day carb budget, but talk to your doctor about it. You may need to start with a 50 gram per day budget, but you want to work your way down to a point where you can begin to lose weight and reverse your diabetes. If you're really conscious about your weight, I would advise against trying to weigh yourself every day. Maybe pick one day a week, like Friday. That would be my advice. Weigh yourself on Friday. Because it's a focal point of the whole week. You know, you can look towards Friday. On Friday, when you weigh yourself, take everything off. Weigh yourself. If you've lost weight, then that gives you motivation not to blow it on the weekend. If you haven't lost weight, that gives you motivation not to dig yourself a bigger hole on the weekend. Use that Friday way in as a way to motivate you no matter what. Exercise if it's okay with your doctor because exercise helps. It's not as important as diet, but it helps. It's diet that's key. And remember, people get fat from eating sugar, not eating fat. People have been eating fat for hundreds of years. It's only recently when we put all the sugar in our food that we've got the epidemic that we do. We want you to improve your diabetes or even reverse your pre-diabetes. We want you to do this by, by trying to lower your insulin resistance. These insulin levels, these hormone levels that, that are occurring due to the constant sugar bombardment that we're giving. And think about testing often to understand the impacts of breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the impact of the food, the timing of the food, what exercise might do. Don't let anybody stand in your way of testing and understanding your blood sugars. Take control. Get in the game. Talk with your doctor. Big takeaways there. So this concludes our strong day. Um, first overview, welcome. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope this helps you start getting in the game. And we look forward to making more of these for you that will um, help you in all these different um, aspects. Remember, our motto is going to be getting better and learning together. Thanks for being with us.